Hi, everyone. Um, so thank you so much for coming today, and welcome to tonight's conversation on designing safety. It's the fourth in the new standards lecture series this autumn. And just to tell you a bit about the series, it aims to identify and confront some of the barriers to architecture, its education, and practice. And also consider how these can be overcome to embrace wider forms of creativity. So each event in the series addresses the idea of comfort and challenges the idea of standards as a bare minimum or one-size-fits-all approach. And together, we hope to question how we might better provide comfort in all its nuanced forms. So we'd like to give a special mention to Jordan Whitewood Neal for all the conversations, collaboration, and guidance that he's given to help shape this series at the AA as a whole. And Jordan will be joining us later in the series um, for actually the last session this time on the 1st of December. So we hope you'll come back for that. And as well as those conversations with Jordan, um, a lot of the series has actually grew out of a workshop that we ran a few years ago that came out of um, the Disordinary Architecture project that Joss Boyce has been running, and she'll also be part of the session on the 1st of December. And um, it was at that workshop that we developed a kind of cross-institutional workshop between the AA and the Bartlett called New Standards um, that was really questioning uh, who space standards are for and like whether they actually create spaces that are inclusive and comfortable for everyone. And so many of them are based on white male militarized bodies, which I'd say a majority of people don't conform to. So um, it's really a way to, uh, I guess this series is a way to kind of broaden that conversation across a series of topics like tonight's topic. Um, and ho we hope that all of you gathered around the table and even behind the table um, will uh, join in and tell us what you think. Um, it's also, I guess, really exciting today that we've just, well, Catherine, Ellie, and I have just come from a presentation of some research that they'll be talking about later today at City Hall about uh, how to really think about the safety of women, girls, and gender diverse people in public space. So um, the whole point of today is actually to take this, these ideas on safety that Thomas will also be talking about through his recent project and, um, uh, and I guess spread it to a wider audience. And uh, one of the main drivers behind the series was really to move beyond just having a conversation and turn that into action. So we hope this is the beginning of a lot of, um, of overdue change. Um, just, to, I guess, one more thing from me before I hand over to Harriet, is that um, we hope that this series is going to be a kind of test bed for how the AA itself can become more inclusive. And so while the series will end at the end of this term, next term there'll be a charrette or a kind of workshop um, in February that will invite teams of participants um, from across the school, so both staff and students, to uh, participate in a workshop to think about ways in which different spaces and parts of the AA can become more inclusive. And we hope that this will be documented and put forward to the school as ways to catalyze long-term change um, to make the school more inclusive. So um, at the end of my whole spiel, I just wanted to say that my name is actually, my name is Manage Burgis. I'm the uh, head of public engagement here at the AA. And um, I guess as a description, I have dark hair and I'm wearing a black and white tie-dyed outfit. <laughs> Hello everyone, I'm Harriet Jennings and I also work at the AA on the public programme with Manager. Um, my pronouns are she, her and I have dark hair with a blonde streak and I'm wearing a red jumper. Um, and yeah, we've been working together on this series for a while now, so it's great to have you all here for this event. Um, so we're really delighted to have Catherine Timmins, Ellie Cosgrave and Thomas Faulkner here with us tonight. I'll briefly introduce them. So. Catherine is Principal Project Officer for Regeneration at the Greater London Authority, the GLA. She manages the mayoral funded strategic regeneration projects that support inclusive city growth and leads urban research agendas with a focus on the public realm. Dr. Ellie Cosgrave is Director of Publica's Community Interest Company and Research. She is an expert on issues surrounding inclusive Oh, sorry. Yeah, <laughs> sorry. <laughs> Ellie. Ellie is the director of Publica's Community Interest Company and Research. She is an expert on issues surrounding inclusive urbanization and um, as an engineer, interdisciplinary researcher, dancer, and trained systems thinker, she is motivated by how scientific endeavor, artistic practice, and policy innovation can combine to create a healthier and fairer society, particularly with respect to gender and just climate transitions. And finally, Thomas Faulkner is an architectural translator and researcher with an interest in the role of the architect as mediator 
and the cyclical dialogue that the tool of the interview has with design. He graduated from the AA with honours and has continued to work with survivors of domestic abuse to reposition architecture from a tool of harm into a space that can better enable recovery. So in tonight's conversation, Catherine and Ellie will discuss how our cities and spaces can be better designed to consider the needs of those who identify as women rather than always requiring them to adapt to spaces designed for men. They will reflect on this through research developed for the Mayor of London around the safety of women, girls and gender diverse people. Thomas will then share his diploma project in which he worked with survivors of domestic abuse to transform architecture from a complicit weapon into a safe space. He will discuss this process as well as how he is continuing this work through his current practice. So after the presentations, we want to open up the conversation um, to take place around this communal table. So um, yeah, please feel free to ask questions. We can pass the microphones around if you want to use them. Um, and we do have some people watching online. So if you feel comfortable using a microphone, then that just means that they can hear the questions. Um, we have got food and drink as well. So yeah, don't be shy. Come up, help yourselves, and feel free to walk around. Um, we have um, British Sign Language Interpretation, so a massive thanks to Anne and Michelle, um, who are sitting just opposite me over here. So if you need to have a clear line of vision to them, please feel free to come and take one of these seats so that you can view them clearly and just let us know if you need any help moving. Um, and yeah, also just a bit more of housekeeping. We have a quiet room over there in the far corner, so if you need to take some time out, please feel free to go and use it. There's also an accessible toilet, which is um, through the door there, through a corridor, and on your left, and it's signposted. But again, if you need any help throughout the event, just let me or Manashe know, and we can help. So I think that's everything, and I will now pass over to Catherine and Ellie. Thank you all. Oh, sorry, Thomas. <laughs> Thank you, everybody. Um, it's a real joy to be back um, presenting uh, the work where I presented last my honours presentation. Um, I will actually, I won't actually be presenting my um, diploma project today, but taking extracts from it and giving you a bit more insight into uh, the behind the scenes of how the project was formed through those processes of interviews. Um, so I'm just going to begin by reading um, this uh, statement you can see on screen here. The stage is set, itself a tool of force, curtain to provide both privacy and power to every violent scene. The cast of two, abuser and abused, and those outside with minds averted, waiting in the wings. So architectural literature often describes the home as a haven, a castle beyond closed doors. However, this has been reconsidered since the 2020 national lockdown, with a rise in offences of domestic abuse across 80% of England. As I undertake this research as a male in a predominantly female victim-survivor field, various ethical limitations have occurred. I therefore position the work as an architectural translator between survivors of domestic abuse and architectural space. The extracts from the research shown tonight will be a retelling of accounts told to me in conversations with survivors of domestic abuse. And I'll be quoting these accounts to reveal the role that architecture currently plays in abuse and further the role it must play. And so I'd like to state at the outset um, that the content accounts told may be triggering to some people, and if any anybody needs to step out during the presentation, then please do feel free to do so. He would trap me in the kitchen or somewhere so I couldn't escape. And uh, he would, he, he, I knew I was gonna get beaten up and that was it. Every time he walked in the house, I used to shake. Um, I don't know what's happened in an argument and he got me into the corner of the kitchen and he grabbed a knife. And I know once he really, really shoved me in the kitchen and um, the corner clink on the old cabinets um, went right into my back and cut all my back. But the home became in the way. <laughs> So tonight we will look at how architecture plays a role in domestic abuse across four different stages. Firstly, we will look at how the home has become weaponized. 
In doing so, I acknowledge abuse as wholly the responsibility of the perpetrator. I do not suggest that certain architectural conditions provoke domestic abuse, but instead assess how architecture has been mishandled or even abused to become a weapon in the process of abuse. Account 1, a house tour. This first account, told through a short video, reveals how the abuser confines the survivor to certain walls of the home. Additionally, the video exposes further the use of architecture in abuse behind the veil of bricks and mortar. There were times when my partner would lock me in the house and take the keys with him. I couldn't get to work and consequently lost my job. My partner would often force me up against the walls. I'm not able to be specific about where because it happened so often. He would punch holes through the walls and the doors and tell me to repair them because they were my fault. The doors became a weapon in the home. He would use them to jam my arms so tightly it felt like they were broken. He would throw plates at my head, along with other objects, making a mess, and then would expect me to tidy it up. He would never help with the house. When he got angry, he would take out one of his knives to play with it, knowing this would scare me. One time he held a butterfly knife to my neck. I would sit on the edge of the sofa so that I could see when he returned. I wouldn't move when he hurt me. I didn't want him to feel like he had won. The balustrade used to break ribs, heat sources used to burn hands, and kitchen counters used to cut open the back of survivors are just a few accounts told in conversation. Interviews with survivors speak of a series of architectural fragments used in abuse. These accounts have therefore been translated into a spatial reading to clearly correlate common trends of how the home has been used as a weapon. Although not the cause of abuse, the inseparable link between the home and abuse trauma has become a pertinent subject for the architect. Secondly, we look at the role that the home and the surrounding neighbourhood plays in escape. With events of abuse demarcated by the perimeter walls of the property, the surrounding social setup has a significant role in providing momentary safety in order to escape abuse. The role of the neighbour, the stranger, the school and the family all form crucial characters in this initial stage set. Who and what interferes with what and whom, to what extent, when and how, are significant questions that the urban designer now has to ask himself. Account number two, neighbours. I quote, at some point I managed to run to my window and opened it and jumped out. There was scaffolding outside my house. As I've jumped out onto the scaffolding in bare feet and shorts, he grabs me by the hair to drag me back through the window, but I still managed to get away and I ran all the way down the scaffolding and back through my living room window below my bedroom. He was already standing there in the living room and said, you ain't leaving, and dragged me back upstairs and kept me locked in my bedroom for four hours. I sat and for four hours shaking in fear, crying. End quote. The following day, this survivor reached out to a stranger on the way to taking her children to school who alerted the police, yet the police unable to find the abuser meant that this lady then returned home. It is here where the abuser jumped down from hiding in the loft, scaring the victim. She again fled to a neighbour who contacted the police, and at this time, they made an arrest. Account three, my son and the courtyard. Similarly relying on a neighbour's goodwill to do the right thing, one lady recollects on it of instances where the role of the neighbour was to play a pivotal role in escape. I quote, I lived in a flat. One of the neighbours heard him threatening to throw me out the window. She called the child protection. Someone came, but we convinced her nothing was wrong, so they never came back again. They saw us together in the house, so I couldn't say anything. In the two-bedroom terraced house, my son, when he was about five or six, would hear something going on, and he would run, run out the house because he, the abuser, would trap me in the kitchen or somewhere so I couldn't escape. My son would go running in his pyjamas and knock on a neighbour's door and they would call the police. We have a little courtyard. It is safer because there is always someone nearby. It made me feel safer because they heard more of what was going on. 
So often we consider successful architecture as private architecture, private garden spaces, sound insulated. Nevertheless, in instances of domestic abuse, escape often only comes through the neighbor being forced to step in. One interviewee states, they, that being the neighbors, were more involved in, we just want some peace and quiet. They realized that the noise was me being knocked about, but they didn't really care. They just wanted it to be quiet. And they recognized there was a problem. So the best way for them to get their peace and quiet was to resolve the problem. Often labeled as a domestic, we recognize the home life as something separate from us, ultimately leaving the abuse to continue in abuse. Nevertheless, in these examples given, architecture forces the neighbor, the stranger, the friend, albeit a reticent one, to respond. Thirdly, we look at how the house post-abuse can and does actually delay the recovery. In 2021, the UK government responded to the rise in offenses of domestic abuse um, with the Domestic Abuse Act, giving priority to the survivor into social housing. Nevertheless, with no spatial criteria, the act excludes the architect from the conversation. Consequently, social housing as a long-term solution for many is ill-favored or even worse than staying with the abuser. Account four, selling the house. I've got to leave him and then thinking how. I haven't got enough money. It is going to take ages. It then takes ages to sell the house, to then get his agreement. By the time you've done that, you start talking and then he says, well, I'm really sorry, can we talk? Although the act supports leaving the home, social housing as a response to rehousing does not currently consider the trigger that architecture can be. Account five, architecture as a trigger. I did break a rib once, and at, at, that actually was on the banisters. I was leant over and dangled. When I go around to people's houses now, it's all the thing to have tiled flooring in the hallway, and I'm thinking, that's dangerous at the bottom of the stairs. It is the view that rehousing should be primarily to provide immediate safety that is actually impeding the possibility for social housing to have a real impact on aiding recovery. Even if the abuser is taken out of the picture, the architecture of the home so often invokes fear provoked by what the home once was. Therefore, I conclude with the fundamental output to the research the development of a spatial criteria that sits in accordance with the 2021 Domestic Abuse Act. The guide would work predominantly across three scales, consisting of a retrofitting to existing triggers, a redesign to new build social housing, and a series of public inclusions in order to provide a platform for new happenings. These stages can be seen in this extract from my fifth year project, a proposal for the utilization of rooftops on low rise social housing to form a platform for recovery. I like to come out here in the mornings, see what's going on outside. He's already up and out, and then head back in, start the day. There's a real parallel between light and progress. I feel like I'm finally starting to get back to a sense of normality, at least a new kind of normal. I feel best when my mind is busy and doing something. When I'm alone at home, things always seem much harder. So I come out here, mainly to occupy my mind, to help forget and to also start something new, spending time with my neighbors. We go to the crash twice a week. It's an hour or two where she's happy playing with her friends and I can just unwind with a cup of tea along with any other parents that want to stay.
The evenings are nicest for me. When the kids have gone to bed, I'll come and just sit here for a bit and lose track of time watching the city lights. It makes me feel hopeful. And I like that. I like feeling like that. In conclusion, it is architecture that provides the stage set for domestic abuse and provides the tools of violence for abuse. Architecture gives the abuser the privacy and power to perpetrate their violence, and it is architecture that casts the characters of abuser, abused, and the peripheral reticent neighbour. Therefore, it is imperative to question the role of architecture within domestic abuse, and consequently the role it must play to become an architectural antonym transitioning the voice for the survivor from a place of violence to a home of refuge. Thank you. Hi, everyone. Thank you. Thank you so much. Could we put it on full screen as well? Yeah. So we are here today to tell you a bit about some of the research that we have done about um, gender inclusive public spaces. But we thought a, a good place to start was to, with a bit of a journey as to how we ourselves got to be here, <laughs> here today in this room, um, but also uh, having this as a body of work. Um, and I guess I'm gonna start before all of the pictures that. Are on the screen to say that um, as, a, as a, a teenager, I decided that for me, it was all about engineering and infrastructure. And that was because I really understood as a girl growing up in London, how much the city around me uh, was shaping my life and shaping what I could do um, and how I could see my friends. And I wanted a bit of that power. <laughs> um, but I guess, uh, all the way through this, I'll, I'll flip between the personal and the professional. Um, also, as a girl growing up in London, I also understood from a very young age how simply presenting as female in public space made me vulnerable, vulnerable to male violence against me. And these were sort of two things that I hadn't connected. It would take another sort of 10 years before I would connect those two things. But this is really kind of the start of my journey. Um, so then I did become an engineer and they actually gave me a job at Arup and I worked there for a number of years. Um, interested at that time, I was doing my PhD with Arup, looking at the relationship between technology, cities and uh, public policy. And it was there that I really understood the power of um, education about investment decisions. Um, uh, uh, um, priority setting as, an, as a really important part of setting great, creating great cities. Um, but I also, my kind of personal learning in, in working in the construction industry was that the very organizations and institutions that were producing our cities and making design decisions were laced with misogyny. Um, and that, the, that um, it was itself not included. Um, and so it was at that time that I helped found an organization called Science Girl, <laughs> Girl, Science Girl, with two R's. Oh, there she is. Oh, you can't see the logo there. But um, it was an organization supporting women in science and engineering careers. I also, um, a bit later, found, um, run, uh, helped to run an organization called the My Body Back Project, which provides um, medical... Uh, access to medical, sexual health, and maternity care to women who have experienced sexual violence. Um, and so I, th that was really just a passion and um, a kind of something I couldn't help being part of my life. And I'm delighted over the last um, 10 years or so as I have become an academic and working at UCL and now, in fact, the next slide. Uh, now working at Publica, leading our work on gen um, our not-for-profit work on gender inclusion, um, uh, led me to this woman and <laughs> to the work that we're presenting today. So I'll hand over. Oh, oh, this is fun. Thanks, Ellie. Um, 
Thank you. Um, so, hi everyone, I'm Catherine, um, and I get to work with this woman. Um, if we go to the next slide, please. So, Manager said it would be useful, because there's lots of students in the room, as Ellie has done, to sort of talk a little bit about who we are and how we got to doing this. So, um, I'm a Principal Project Officer for the Regeneration Team at the Greater London Authority, which is the Mayor of London, um, but that's quite complicated. So what that means is that I work in a team that supports the built environment sector to design a city for all Londoners. Um, generally, basically everything that's not housing, our team focus on, focuses on. And similar to what you were saying, that experience of like being in a city growing up and wanting a, a piece of the pie, wanting to help shape that, was really inspiring to me. So I went to architecture school, as lots of you are, um, qualified as an architect, but realized that for me, working in practice felt too far removed from people and the questions that I wanted to ask. Um, so I no longer work in practice, but I, I still use those skills every day, and I think it's important to like value that um, diversity of skills. So um, working at the GLA, you have a much more strategic overview of places. You work more closely with people and communities and get to ask those bigger questions. So in, I'm just going to summarise what we do in three things because it might be useful for any of you who are thinking of doing similar things. So the first thing is we do lots of research, urban research on current and emerging themes um, about the built environment. Next slide, please. Um, and we also give out funding to support community-led regeneration projects, such as this community farm and kitchen facility in Lambeth. Um, and we work with communities to bring forward their ambitions for their local areas, and we bring architects and designers in to embed high-quality uh, design and the research. Next slide, please. Um, and finally, the third thing that we do is we get involved in this strategic regeneration. So when a place is undergoing like an intense amount of change, we help to manage that process and slow down the conversation between developers and planners. Um, and we fund studies that support that. So uh, that might be useful for if any of you in the room are thinking about not working in practice. Um, but back to the topic. Um, next slide, please. So, Ellie and I wanted to talk to you about how we got to this point of doing this research. And um, the, first, the first part of this was sort of looking at the London plan and making sure that we were res responding to what's in the London plan about public space being inclusive and accessible. And so we did a, a, a couple of pieces of research um, that sort of built up to this one displayed here, and they each respond to a different part of uh, policy around pushing the boundaries of how we include and how we make these spaces feel inviting and you feel a part of them. Um, can we skip over the next one, please, and go... Yeah, thank you. So oh, all of that was happening, and I think... Um, it, it, just to give some context, as soon as we finished the last piece of research, um, there was a, a crisis in women and girls' safety in the public realm, which we're all well aware of. So the recent murders of um, Biba Henry and um, Sabina Nessa, Sarah Everard, etc., And we, we needed to understand quickly how, does, how design impacts that. We know design isn't the problem, um, but there is there is something that we can do. But, yeah, so basically no amount of lighting can abolish the patriarchy. We know that the patriarchy is the issue. But there are things that we can do to support the sector. So looking at what we needed to draw together, what we know already, um, and how we can learn a bit more and start to support designers to really think through these issues. So, next slide, please. We we naively thought, great, let's do some design guidance. That will, you know, help this. But once we started looking into it, realised that we have no clue what to say in that design guidance. We don't know the answers here. 
Um, so instead, we're trialing this more experimental approach where we have three phases of research and we're very open to what comes out of it. So the first piece of the research um, is what Ellie's going to talk to, which is this incredible document she's put together. And it looks at kind of firstly understanding safety. What do we mean by safety? Um, how does everybody experience safety differently? And how do we pivot the conversation from crime statistics reported to experiences and perceptions of safety? Um, it also includes some foundational principles that we all need to upskill on to get to grips with these issues and then puts together a list of questions to designers to support architects, planners, um, everybody to think, to ask questions and to be critical at each stage of the design process. The idea then is that we take this piece of work and test it with live projects. So we're partnering with projects that are on site now, projects that are gearing up to go on site, and we'll plug in our Mayor's Design Advocates, of which manager is one, and Hilary and Rebecca are here as well, and give, give them these questions and say, okay, start the dialogue, see what happens, see if people are open to this conversation, and see what you can be what you can push, how you can encourage experimentation in this arena. Um, so at that point, I'm going to hand over to you. Fantastic. So what I'd like to do just to, to start off the conversation is just flick through the contents of the report and pick up on some of the main points that we make. Um, next slide, please. Get there in mind too. Um, so the report is really structured around. I said three three halves. <laughs> That's not a thing. Um, there are uh, th three main sections, but I, th I think the first two sections really work together to be about like how can we understand what safety is? What are we talking about when we talk about safety? And um, another section really on um, upskilling the reader, hopefully on the the, um, I, I, what we call the key foundational concepts that you have to understand in order to be able to have good conversations about gender inclusion. Um, so I'm going to run through some of those ideas now. The first is understanding safety. Um, we have two ways of explaining what we mean when we're talking about safety. The first one is to understand that safety exists uh, as a spectrum, uh, on a spectrum of feelings and experiences. These uh, span from the kind of everyday, what we might think of as mild inconveniences that affect our lives, all the way up into the um, the, a position where we are um, physically or psychologically in extreme danger. And so what we're talking about when we're talking about these mild inconveniences um, are things like having to take the longer route home or having to take um, a buggy up the steps um, all the time. And, um, um, and uh, another example is just the kind of everyday safety work that we um, undertake in order to keep ourselves safe. So that might be holding an object in our fists or looking down at the street. Um, and um, the part of the reason that we believe that these mild inconveniences, so-called mild inconveniences, need to be taken as seriously is because as they are added up over the course of a, a woman's um, uh, uh, or anyone who identifies as a woman's lifetime, this, um, this um, f radically reshapes their lives. And I want to read a quote from uh, Fiona, Vera Gray and Liz Kelly, who says, when considered in isolation, such changes can be dismissed as annoying but necessary result of living in a world where occasionally strangers may do you harm. But when it's seen across the course of a woman's lifetime, these adaptations come to be understood as a particularly gendered message that women need to be less, less vocal, less visible, and less free in order to be safe. 
Throughout the report as well, we include many quotes from previous uh, for, from um, uh, activists and community groups um, because we understand that we don't hold the whole story and it's not uh, our, uh, um, any one story to be told. So we make sure that throughout the report we have these quotes. Thank you. The other way that we uh, position safety is to understand it uh, through three separate lenses. So often when we're thinking about safety, um, our automatic assumption is that we're, we're talking about avoiding um, crime or harassment and intimidation. But actually, an overall and more holistic view of safety would also take into account that the space is usable and that, um, uh, for, so that makes sense from a kind of physical, it, does this space meet my needs? And thirdly, um, taking the perspective of a sense of belonging uh, as an essential safety requirement. So what are we doing in public spaces to signal to people that you do not need to alter yourself in order to be accepted. So those are our two uh, key frameworks that lay the foundation. We then go on in the next slide to um, describe some of these basic foundations, um, which I'll read the headlines, but you can go and dig into the report. It's now online. Um, to, for the more details. So that is that gender is a spectrum. Um, the idea that women, girls, um, and gender diverse people don't need to be protected from the city, they need the power to reshape it. This is an uh, argument of moving from positioning um, women, girls, and gender diverse people as purely as victims and understanding the ways in which we can dismantle the barriers to, um, to living a free and full life. Um, the idea that there is no such thing as a safe city. I'll let you read that. To, there's lots of details in that one. Um, uh, uh, intersectionality, uh, the problem with policing and crime approaches, and um, the need for a more diverse sector. Uh, we also, uh, the next section of the report is laying out these questions to ask ourselves, which is much more a call to action and a... Um, um, uh, so, supposed to be a helpful set of questions that will help you think through the problem. We have positioned them as a set of questions because we know that there is no single answer to the, to the question of um, gender inclusion, that the uh, experts already exist within communities and within um, design teams that we don't, you know, I don't need to sit and tell you, tell communities what is best for them. Um, and also because we want, we hope that those questions will foster conversation, that they will foster experimentation um, and uh, creativity. Thank you. Oh, yeah, no, sorry. <laughs> um, so, yeah, just to go back to how we're applying all of this amazing work that Ellie has done, we have. Um, 41 or 42, I can't remember, mayor's design advocates. So they are built environment um, experts, professionals who work across London to promote and advocate for high quality design and emerging issues around the built environment. And so we want to take those questions and these mayor's design advocates, as I mentioned earlier, and plug them into these live projects that we've identified across London. And I think what we're trying to do is, as I said earlier, experiment so that we're in, uh, thinking through the participation of women, girls, and gender diverse people in the process. That's one of the only ways that you can affect feelings of safety and experiences of safety is to feel like you have a role and feel like you can participate in your in your local environment. So we don't know what's going to happen next, but we're excited to see those experiments. Um, and then the next slide, please. Um, the last slide just shows that in the report, there are a series of case studies. And I think it's important to note that we always look to Scandinavia here because um, 
they have the best examples. And I think what we're trying to do is understand what does good look like in London? And by good, I don't mean perfect, because there is no such thing as a safe space, but good as in we're starting that conversation, we're including those communities, we're listening to them and taking their testimonies seriously. So hopefully, um, at some point next year, we'll be able to come back and share with you the case studies so that we have our own to be proud of and to discuss and to continue that conversation on because it's only an evolving topic. Um, yeah, thank you. I think that's everything. Um, well, thank you so much to the three of you for um, such clear and articulate presentations on very complex and, and difficult topics to, to be able to address and to talk about, um, especially because, as you all articulated, you can't really design safety, um, nor can you actually define it as any one thing. And um, so I think what was really interesting, actually, in, all, in both kind of projects that were presented was actually how you would more designing inclusive processes and ways to actually uh, make the survivors of domestic violence or the voices of women, girls, and gender diverse people heard through actually designing a process rather than um, relying on, I guess, things that maybe are the default of just, just thinking about lighting and sight lines and things like that. And so I was just, it, because it's a parallel between the methodology that you've um, I guess both projects have used. I was wondering if you could talk a bit more about how to design inclusive processes, but also the role of questions. Because, I mean, Thomas, you were conducting these interviews and you described your practice as that of an architectural translator. Um, but then I think a bulk of the document that um, Catherine and Ellie presented is actually a, a very long list of questions that hopefully um, practitioners can start to use to become better listeners um, and pick and choose from depending on the project that's being discussed. So maybe you could um, each speak a bit about, about the process, but also the role of the question. Yeah, yeah. Um, so my, my process is very much, I mean, as I said at the start, um, very much trying, aiming to remove my um, own voice from a conversation um, that is dealing with many things that I have not and will n not likely ever experience through my lifetime. Um, and so the process then becomes about allowing people who have experienced it, people who are the experts in that sense of the field, um, those who have lived out um, domestic abuse, and allow their voice to um, speak. So I then position myself as a mediator I aim to use the skill sets of the architect um, to then be able to actually support these communities. I don't claim that I know what's best for them because I don't. And so therefore, what I want to be able to do is to just use the skills that I do have to be able to have their voices heard. Um, so the process in which I, I go through within my work is um, going through a process of, of listening, going through a process of um, analyzing uh, those conversations of speaking with survivors, and then a process of speaking, and that speaking isn't my own voice coming through, but it's their voices that I'm speaking on behalf of. And then uh, lastly, within that cycle is that process of response to then be able to actually go back to uh, members of those communities, members of um, those people who have experienced domestic abuse, and uh, be able to talk through the work, the research that I've um, done with them. And I think the most important thing on this is that it's, it's about researching with um, the communities with um, people who experience domestic abuse rather than researching on them. And I learned that quite early on in the process that I shouldn't define my output before speaking um, to the communities and so very much to allow their um, expertise to come forwards and be able to speak on behalf of them and then go back to them and then just continue this cycle over and over again. So that's... Yeah, maybe a bit more. I hope I kind of answer the question. Um, just to build on that, I think, yeah, it's a really good question about the role of questions. And um, the reason that we're pivoting more towards that is because we don't know the answers. And as Ellie said, the communities are the authors of those stories and we need to listen really carefully. But 
not just listen, I think we need to take accountability and act on what they say, take what they say very seriously, and um, make sure that the seldomly heard voices have, uh, have priority, because I think the balance is always off with the people who shout loudest in the room. So we really struggle, as we all know, with engagement to bring in those seldomly heard voices. But we talked today a bit about um, exclude to include and how you can feel comfortable with that. Feel comfortable with the fact that it's okay to exclude the voices that we always hear in order to um, escalate and give a, a stronger platform to the voices that we don't hear as often. Great. I'd just add, we, we, we are talking a lot about knowing what we don't know, and that's very important, and valuing community expertise. That's not the same thing as saying we don't know anything about gender inclusion or the key themes, and I think we have to distinguish quite well between those, because actually there's been you know, decades and decades of research and theory um, that has, have gone into structuring how we should be thinking about this. And um, what I think is useful about questions is we, we can think about them as questions or we can think about them, uh, questions meaning we don't know the answer, or we can think about them as well as prompts, meaning we know this category is important and we know that there are ways in which, ways in which we think about it that are going to be helpful for you. So here is a, a prompt to make sure that it's included. And that then fits into a more holistic framework. But the important thing about those prompts is that they are actionable. They are the start of a conversation that will then be, begin to include um, uh, the, the stories, perspectives, and expertise of the people who are not the ones who've been studying it for 20 years and think they know better because don't you know who I am? Um, thank you all again for amazing um, presentations. I was really struck when you said that all your examples are Scandinavian, and I was wondering if you could just talk a bit more about that and why, why you think Scandinavia has better examples when it is also perhaps you know, a, a patriarchy as well as the UK. Well, oh, this is, yeah. I mean, that was a massive generalisation. <laughs> Um, but I think, I mean, uh, we were talking about this earlier today. Uh, um, Rebecca over there is our, one of our men's design advocates who is Swedish and works in Sweden. And we were talking about the fact that um, in Sweden, it's really easy to talk about gender. It's really like part of the lexicon. It's comfortable, like no one's scared when you bring that discussion into the room. Um, and yet in Sweden, with race, you're saying that that's not the case. Like, that is a very uncomfortable topic. And I think here we're slightly the other way around in that we still have a, a massive issue with talking about race, but we're getting more comfortable with being uncomfortable about talking about it. Whereas with gender, especially in the built environment sector, it's it feels like something that people are nervous about because, well, all feedback that we've had when we've um, spoken to developers or planners is, is that there's a bit of anxiety around talking about gender and safety because if you design a public space or approve the planning permission for a public space and then something happens, every, like who's to blame? Because we, you know, we we did the good design. We met all of the standards, and I think that's what's, uh, yeah, we're, we're very uncomfortable still. I think that's what's really powerful about what Ellie was presenting about. There is no such thing as a safe city. You can never rubber stamp a space and be like, "That's safe now. We're done." Um, and I think that's what's brilliant about this series is that you're challenging the standards that people try and meet and pretend that they've met and now it's done and we can forget about it. So, I mean, that made no sense and didn't really answer your question, but I think what we're trying to do is get more comfortable in the development sector talking about gender. And there are some great examples in London and the UK, 
but it's um, we need more and we need to like challenge and learn from those and experiment and be comfortable with failure and see what happens. Um, and I think that's what's been really great at you know seeing some built, delivered examples in Scandinavia. We have maybe less. Ask a question. Oh, <laughs> that was really surprising. Um, <laughs> um, I'm really interested in um, when you're saying that you had some projects at uh, a sort of test beds, and and obviously you can't design a safe city, but how do you assess or you know review and ha what are you hoping are the outcomes of these test bed projects? Because there's inherently always so many challenges with qualitative sort of uh, feedback and reviewing, you know, we like to put things in boxes, don't we? And uh, uh, how are you doing that? <laughs> and I suppose the other thing is that if they're gonna be on site in January, have the questions been asked on these projects early doors or, you know, yeah. Yeah, it's a really good question and one we are very much grappling with. I think we're not, um, what we're trying to do is get comfortable with talking about it, like I was saying. So this isn't going to fix these places. This isn't gonna stop incidents happening, but what it is hopefully going to do is to bring that conversation to the table and, um, with, with and, and start to reach out to those seldomly heard groups and say, okay, this might not have been in the brief, but what can we do now? Because we have, at the GLA, we have a role in lots of live projects across London, and what we're trying to do is use our very, very limited power to um, learn something and then apply it to lots of live projects. And we work on a huge spectrum of projects that are with, you know, very straightforward developers who don't think about this at all to projects that are already listening, already aware. And we're trying to intervene and understand what happens when you ask these questions along that spectrum. Um, and we're not going to be measuring them in a very quantitative way, but more in that qualitative way of seeing if it's affected how people feel. Or if it hasn't, then why and what else can we do? But basically, we don't know. <laughs> but at least we're open to failure. And I think providing some space for that conversation is all that we can do as, a, as the GLA at this stage, I think. Well, there's lots more we can do, but yeah. <laughs> and sorry, just as a quick follow-up, how have uh, you assessed those examples that you've put in um, the, like the case studies, how have, how have they been chosen as sort of good assessments of this? So for each of the case studies, it's, it's not an endorsement, but it generally was trying to point to um, a, uh, a perspective that looks at a new way of thinking about something or that, um, uh, for example, flipping who is asking the questions in any kind of design review with communities and designers, um, looking at um, examples of uh, celebrating trans women in public spaces through public art, and to show the ways in which uh, it actually manifests in material, uh, mater materiality, I guess. <laughs> um, and so that's that. It's really to just to give uh, inspiration uh, cl and clarity in what actually might change. So um, there's that. In terms of what do we expect to see differently? Like what do we expect the outcomes to be? Um, always at the centre of what we were trying to achieve with this was to support people in making good decisions throughout the design process. So it's or the questions, we've got 10, but they're structured between uh, project setup, understand, understanding and scoping the project, co-design and making, and then management and using the space. 
Um, and so depending on the project, depending on the stage, we've got some stuff that we can do. So again, it, we're not going to ask all the questions and we're not going to prompt it, but we've got these, we, we've got these prompts that we can, um, we can hope will make a difference. And again, the purpose of this ourselves is experimentation. So we don't know what will happen, otherwise it wouldn't be research. Um, and uh, so this is a sort of journey of exploration as well. I would also add that um, participation is at the core of this. And the ways in which we measure the effectiveness of participation is through um, qualitative responses and testimony from people who have been involved and local communities. We're currently working on a project with um, Wandsworth Council, separate to this, um, around experiences of the nighttime. And we're in, uh, we used um, soundscapes as a, as a way of discussing the city. So we, we're recording sounds and using that as a, as a way to start our conversations. Um, but one of the participants was too young to participate, so she brought her mum, and we decided it was fine if her mother and daughter did it together. And she, uh, the mother in the last session said, um, participating in this process has changed my daughter's experience of, of the local area. She didn't know, we didn't know that people cared and that were do doing anything. They had experienced racial hate crime, and they didn't, the child did not want to go out ever. They didn't even want to stay on the ground floor of their house. And now she was saying, my daughter is excited, wants to go out, keeps asking me if I can go out. So this is an example of the ways in which when we take time to work with communities and understand community needs and feed that into strategies, and um, it's the participation that is transformative. It doesn't matter, I mean, don't quote me on it. <laughs> it, it, it the, part, the participation itself can transform people's lives, and we need more of it. Thank you. Hi. Um, I am also apologies right off the bat if this is not the most articulate question. I'm a bit of a rambler. Um, I, I'm somebody who identifies as a woman and um, being a woman really informs my life. Um, but something I think that really informs how I be a woman is, is my class and my background. And I'd just be really interested to hear both from a perspective of public spaces and also, you know, domestic violence, how, how it's been for you reaching um, people from a working class background and also how, th how that's informed your work and how that's informed your conversations. Um, I think maybe what, what you spoke about in terms of like participation being really key um, and also uh, how do we, you know, block the voices that we hear all the time. I wonder if that might be part of that conversation, but Thomas, you too, I'm, I'm really interested to, to hear about that from you. I think it class is, is profoundly interesting and complex in terms of the way in which people experience it and the way, uh, you know, ultimately it's about privilege and it's about power and in different spaces, different, that, that plays out differently. And when you're relating to different, depends who you're relating to and with. Certainly there's a power dynamic set up in consultation most of the time. And I think, um, for me, I understand privilege uh, from a class perspective in terms of uh, how you are perceived um, as being educated, <laughs> um, expert, um, uh, um, knowledgeable about anything <clears throat> and a right to speak probably are some of the ways in which class plays out as a power in a, in a power dynamic and we have to acknowledge the spaces we're in the reality of the power dynamic that is being set up and those of us who are have power in that uh, space 
need to actively take their power away from themselves. <laughs> Usually by stopping talking, which is something I'm working on. <laughs> um, I'm going to say very little on, on this question simply because I feel like I'm um, not at the stage yet where I feel like I can answer it um, enough. What I would say is that um, something that shaped a lot of uh, my thinking on the subject is um, Joanna Bork's book uh, called Disgrace, and it's come out fairly recently. Um, but she really addresses within that um, the focal point of how class um, will, well, from, from her findings, how class very often determined the output of what your experiences would be, um, very much for, from those who have experienced sexual violence. And within my own research, I haven't uh, dived deep enough yet, and that's something that I was always planning to do since finishing um, my fifth year work, but dive deep enough into the subject of across the country, as mainly within, within the UK, what are the defining factors that uh, can start to group those who experience domestic abuse? Um, are there defining factors? Are there similarities that come out? Is there an aspect of class? Is there an aspect of wealth? Is there an aspect um, of, of these different um, categories? And it's something where it's the people that I, I spoke to um, were all a variety of people who have all experienced domestic abuse. And so from the early stages of, of, of the work, from, from the own conversations that I've had, I'm not able to at the moment identify um, clear enough to be able to say the difference that class makes within the process of domestic abuse. However, I'm sure there are people that can answer that far better than I could with, with a bit more um, knowledge behind them. So, yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Um, very exciting that this is happening and, and being led on by the GLA and Publica, and I um, don't at all for a moment underestimate how complex this is to do. Um, I'm interested if you could share any more about from your case studies, um, if I think about kind of experience of a city, and if we think of cities as nodes and destination points, but also connectors, um, if I share my own personal experience, it's often the connectors, the routes between places where I might not feel so safe. And when I'm passing through those places, I'm passing through multiple landowners, um, management structures. Are you uncovering? I, I can manage and um, imagine more easily nodes, you know, playgrounds that might be designed or squares or marketplaces or um, that are designed with, with women's um, safety in mind. But um, has, have you had any thoughts yet about how do you deal with the complexities of a city that's made up of multiple, <laughs> multiple different owners and agents? And therefore, what guidance can this offer particularly to um, designers when they might have a relatively small brief, but actually what they're dealing with needs to expand and connect more widely across a neighbourhood or a city to actually make meaningful change, particularly when you, you take this agenda and its in intersection with um, having a more climate aware agenda and the understanding that we need more retrofit. So have, are you seeing any opportunities coming up from that through any of the case studies that you're looking at? Um, that are not just about design, but about the mechanics behind how those kind of contracts are set up? I think that, that this question perfectly articulates the kind of layers of complexity that we're kind of dealing with when we're trying to think about holistically delivering a safer experience. And um, uh, I, uh, the, just to kind of reiterate your point, I think a, a useful way to think about it is in terms of, I think earlier this afternoon we were talking about, it's about experience, not compliance. So it's not about like, have we done the design appropriately? It's about centering um, the experience of a person. So that involves the relationship between being inside the home and outside of the home, and obviously your different levels of safety at home and outside the home is interrelated because if you are not safe in the home, maybe forced to be outside and vice versa. 
Um, but also, the, so the only thing that I can point to, and it's actually not a case study because we didn't get it funded, <laughs> so if anyone's listening, um, to, uh, is to create um, whole area action plans is the kind of something that I'm trying to get off the ground where um, we can include bus, bus operators, um, life, uh, venues, um, uh, street um, uh, uh, TFL, people who are involved in, I don't know, like street pastors or, um, you know, other security or policing systems to come to a common vision and view about what the experience might be. And that would include, of course, urban designers um, and people with different levels of power. But when you don't have the same vision, when you don't have the same, like, uh, time scales, action plan, it's very difficult to coordinate those things. I would say, just because it's difficult to coordinate doesn't mean you shouldn't just get on with it and do stuff anyway, because if we're going to wait for coordination, like, we're going to be waiting a long time. But at the same... But um, if we could have a more coordinated approach, we learn from each other, we kind of push each other's timescales, um, and we can, we can have a more holistic vision of that space. If, you, if people know of other examples, I'd be great, really willing to hear about it. Just to add, thanks, Ellie. Um, I think the live projects that we're looking at, we're definitely facing that problem. And we're trying to use our role as a public body to draw together the right people in the room. So TFL, the borough, the developers. And um, it's, it's really, really difficult because sometimes it comes down to, like, where does that red line boundary end and who's paying for what and so this process is trying to do what Ellie said like centering experience um, and this is where our men's design advocates come in because they get to push and ask those difficult questions and like um, yeah push people to go beyond the red line boundary if we as a public body also have skin in the game if we're funding that project we get to lean on them a little bit more um, and but it's really difficult because if we don't have that that skin in the game if we don't have that funding all we can do is uh, is push that conversation as hard as we can and bring the right people together but what we don't want to happen is we don't want to create islands of safety and these these pockets where you feel better but that you can't get to. So the, this work has had um, some really good input, input from TFL and also from MOPAC, um, which is the Mayor's Office for Policing and Crime, to try and start to join those dots a little bit, but it's a massive problem um so yeah we're, we're trying and we need to try a lot harder to to do that i've thought of an example <laughs> so the this is not exactly uh what you were asking but it's like the closest thing i can think of is in terms of finding those liminal or in between spaces and doing projects in them and so there was um, like parabola arts have have been like activating those spaces community projects to find um, um, alleyways and put uh, bars or whatever uh, social cultural infrastructures in them. Um, and so the Parala, Par Parabola Arts did um, an, adopt an alleyway where for one night it became an um, art gallery or a, um, a music venue. And so these are not long-term projects, these are not there all the time, but when, once you have experienced a space that has previously felt um, liminal and spooky, um, in, and you see it filled with community and you feel safe, that does actually, again, have a legacy in your experience and kind of knowledge that this community exists. So that's the, the kind of small uh, one project. Sorry, just while we're waiting, there's um, the artist on the screen, Hannah Benihood, did an another project, actually, actually Girls, some of Girls of the Night, yeah, which um, was amazing at just highlighting 
you know, nothing to do with who owns the space or where the space ended, but it was highlighting issues and pockets um, to try and, yeah, bring this discussion to the foreground. Badly explained, but it's a great project. I just wanted to explore a little bit more this idea of islands of safety and that we shouldn't, I don't think you necessarily meant it in that way, but we shouldn't create them because it highlights the bad bit in between. That's what cities are. Cities are maps of places where people feel safer and less safe and everyone's map is different. That's one of the massive complexities of it. But we already have islands of places people feel safe. It's generally places that are um, less deprived, better off, better housing. Better. These things are already mapped. They're already, they're already there in the world. But what we don't know is how everyone's experience of it works. I don't think we should apologise for trying to make some places feel like islands of safety if it highlights the problems in between. So I think we have to maybe be less apologetic for doing any of that. On, in um, Hannah's um, project, she sort of um, asked loads of people for alleyways in Tottenham that they were too scared to walk down. Um, and so there's ways of sort of gathering that information so it's not just one person's perspective. Just to add. I'll stop talking. <laughs> I, I think when we're just on the islands of safety, I think it's really important as well that we're thinking about safety, we think about for whom is this safe? And when we, um, when we talk about kind of regenerated areas or I don't know, um, it, 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 there are people that are excluded sometimes when those areas pop up. And one of the quotes um, from Untokening Collective, that we use in the report is uh, we are what we are what is removed when safe when spaces get safer for you we're either priced out or policed out um, and so I just want to kind of bring in that point when we're talking about um, safety that we need to like understand what has happened in the history of this space um, but I think that yeah it's just a flag. Hi, everyone. Um, I just wanted to clarify, because I think at the beginning of your presentation, you also mentioned the idea about the, as a woman, identifying that perspective into the environment and design. Uh, I haven't heard much else about that, and obviously the discussions afterwards in, in terms of the word safety comes across as, yeah, dangerous environments, do you know what I mean? I just wanted to clarify, how are you also bringing that perspective in about, is it just being a woman yourself uh, with that perspective that raises the question and therefore makes it more inclusive and less of a disabling environment for women generally, or those who, do you know what I mean? Which, sorry, which perspective? Um, so I think you said in terms of the, uh, the word safety, uh -huh. it wasn't just talking about of course, dangerous spaces. It was also inclusive to, I guess, steps for women with pregnancy. Yes, yes, like yes, yes, right. yes, great. <laughs> um, thank you for that. Um, so, for example, I think this is a, a, a nice one. Um, her barking or the um, uh, the girls of the light as well is about representations of women. Um, so the idea that do I see myself reflected in this space, and therefore is this. Um, a space for me. Um, a lot of, um, so there, there was also, so that's kind of one thing. Then there's another one is when we um, are in a public space, the participation itself hopefully is supposed to orient around how do you use this space? When do you use this space? What are your needs of this space? Um, so that that can be included. And then through co design as well, like those questions start to, to come up as well. Um, we, in the report, we do take it 
into quite a lot more detail than we presented here. So we take the safety spectrum and we take the three lenses. So for example, belonging. And then we look at the ways in which belonging or a lack of belonging can be inconvenient or can cause inconvenience all the way up to a lack of belonging causing a um, more extreme harm um, or harm is probably the wrong word. Tricky to find the right word sometimes. Um, so that is detailed in, in it throughout. But thank you also for noting that we keep going back to fear of violence. Yeah, so now I can't keep quiet anymore. I love having this discussion in London. And actually about the, your question and about the islands of safety, it's like another way going on this is to shift the question uh, where you're supposed to start. My favorite question, where are the girls? So instead of saying we have this project and uh, what would you want from this place, actually kind of lifting up and redesigning a space where the girls are already hanging out. So, and that's kind of a way to oh, shift the investment and uh, go more towards the improving, identifying, designing for more needs uh, instead of uh, oh, starting out the other way around, actually. And our, the Swedish experience is that hmm, when we design, when we do ask the question, where are the girls, we have a stronger result because the girls will still go there afterwards. But uh, in the projects where we have started out uh, uh, setting out the place and then doing the co-creation process, it's been a very valuable process and with lots of learnings and the girls come out really stronger and proud and take people there, but then they don't go there anymore because it's just not close to their space. So, the, uh, which is kind of a nice way, even though it's hard because, I mean, the, pro the projects that are developed are the ones that are developed and you can't really change them. But, uh, it's a nice way to shift the perspective also in the beginning of the project. Um, I was just going to go back to the, the point raised about the spectrum of feeling. And actually, it's so much bigger than that, isn't it? I think th through the presentation, um, keep mentioning about participation and sense of belonging. And... Uh, so much of that chimes with the principles of social integration and if we if there is 50 percent of the population being excluded from being able to successfully participate in society then that's one of the basics of being an active citizen and so we're i think some of the discussions around inclusivity is also around being able to fully participate and bring your bring your true self and being able to uh, change and shape your environment and community. And so, oh, it's, it's great. <laughs> um, it's really exciting. Um, I'm, I guess I'm conscious of time, um, but uh, I don't, also don't want to prevent people from having a longer conversation. So uh, I guess, well, I, I also want to relieve our amazing interpreters who've been working very hard to, um, I guess, also try and interpret lots of really complex ideas and, and, and things like that. I think um, I would just encourage you all to hang around and also get to talk in more detail to Thomas, Ellie and Catherine. But um, I think it was like a nice note to end on to talk about like how it's great that we're having these conversations and, and hopefully we'll have a lot more of them. But um, I guess for now, thank you all so much for coming and for being part of the conversation. And please come to the next two um, sessions in the conversation that remain this term. Next week, there's one on queerness. And then the last one is about comfort, which will be like a kind of a meta discussion on lots of the different lenses through which we've looked at this idea of the problems of standardization. Thank you very much. Thank you.